Hello and welcome to another Lived Quality Conversation on the Lived Quality Podcast. And my wonderful guest today is Iris. Uh, I've known Iris a long time. Uh, we have attended several courses uh, together and she also runs uh, the Wisdom Project, which is a wonderful seven week uh, program. Uh, where there's like a ton of tools that Iris introduces that are very fundamental for exploring, you know, one's own wisdom practices. Actually, to use Vavikian terms, to help you cultivate that ecology of practices. Uh, so, Iris, we we have like great conversations, and um, I learn a lot from these conversations. That's why I really love talking to you, Iris. And uh, so. As it is on this uh, podcast, we usually, I'll invite you in uh, to share with us, you know, what's been on your mind, uh, what, what you've been thinking about, and uh, we'll follow the conversation wherever it goes. So, Iris, how have you been and what has been on your mind <laughs> of late? Um, I have been really good. Honestly, really joyful and happy. Um, enamored of my work um very fortunate that i can do it and and even though it's tiresome because i feel that i'm always starting something um it's very very fulfilling and promising so um, as you know, I started my life, my professional life as an engineer. I moved to be a consultant for organizations, usually the organizations that initially I worked for or with as an engineer. Um, and then became very curious about the psychology that didn't allow people to make the changes they knew they wanted for their organization. So I started taking classes in psychology, and when I decided why not get a degree in psychology in my country of origin. I am originally from Caracas, Venezuela. To to get a master's degree or a PhD on psychology, I had to start from zero, from being a, a junior, a freshman, to, to from zero, from the first year of education. And I already had a master's degree in electrical engineering, and I'm like, what? So um, instead, when I came to Boston, uh, you just register into a master's degree. I did it in master's in psychology and with a <laughs> engineering, electrical engineering degree and a master's in electrical engineering. But I did really well. And then for three years, I worked as a family therapist um, and then went for a PhD in psychology. And so now... Uh, something that I was doing kind of ex ex experimenting with psychology in the projects I did for organizations years and years ago. Now I do it in a rigorous way because now I have a degree, two degrees in psychology, a master's in, in counseling psychology with, with a practice as a family therapist and, and then a PhD in cognitive science. And um, so what I have been doing is working with organizations uh, to help them, you know, improve performance, be agile, deliver on time, et cetera, manage change. But also in parallel, and for more than 20 years, I have been a mindfulness teacher. Uh, my last gig, my last job uh, as a mindfulness teacher started five years ago because there is a local hospital here in the Boston area called Beth Israel Lehi that is creating a center, a mind-body center. They call it a center for psychophysiological research, you know, the relationship between the psyche and the physiology. Mm -hmm. And so I've been working with them for five years, and they are doing research on the impact of meditation in different chronic conditions, such as asthma, chronic back pain, uh, long COVID now. Recently, I finished a class on long COVID with patients who 
complain of long COVID. So um, what happened two and a half years ago is that we went, we went going through COVID and I couldn't work because my work with organizations depend, depends on me doing a lot of networking and going to a bunch of gatherings to, to come, you know, to meet clients, etc. So I had a lot of time to, to stop and think. And among the things that I discovered was the work of John Vervicki, who in his video series gave me the vocabulary to explain what I have been doing for more than 20 years. He gave me a vocabulary to explain what I have been doing. So I have been, to use these words, um, help, helping people transject, you know, like you, you, you have a frame, you understand a problem like this, or oh, this engineer is not productive. Or, or this team has this, you know, you have a frame, a way of understanding the problem. So when, once you start using tools from psychology and also from, from, from change management, a discipline within a management science where you see how to change the way people perform, uh, you start like helping people dissolve their understanding of a particular issue and then create it anew. And then do it like this and do it like this. But what happens when you start doing that is that there is a moment that the person who is doing the framing and reframing and framing and reframing suddenly, and this is the word that Vicky gave me, transject. They become something else. They transform. And so um, I was like, wow, this guy is bringing my two worlds together because my world of being an organizational consultant and my world of being a meditation teacher were fused by the concepts that Vervicki presents because he's both a psychologist, a cognitive scientist and philosopher who teaches at the University of Toronto and publishes, you know, beautiful, powerful, insightful papers that contribute to our understanding of ourselves. But he's also a meditation teacher. So it's just such a gift that I received when I found his work. And that's when I decided to start what I'm doing right now, the Wisdom Project. It's basically how can you uh, address a very challenging issue in your life? Could be a relationship with your mom or your child or your teenager or a career change. How can you address, address I call them wicked, a wicked problem? that usually you think, okay, this is the way to go. And as soon as you start going this way, oh, no, 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 I didn't see this. So you, you are forced, the problem forces you to frame and reframe, frame and reframe. So that's the trick of the Wisdom Project. Choose something that is going to force you to frame and reframe, frame and reframe, with the hope that once you solve that project, you will also be transformed. Your understanding of yourself and the world will be transformed. And that's what I'm doing right now. I mixed my 20 plus, 25 years of mindfulness meditation teacher teaching with my 25 plus years of organizational consultant. And that's what is called right now, the Wisdom Project. And with a group that um, I was very lucky to find, you know, it's just, that's why I guess I'm so joyful. Um, I, I, I'm just working weekly. We meet. Uh, four people, they are scholars. I don't consider my, you know, I learn a lot. I don't consider myself a scholar. I, I think I'm a practical person who is trying to use concepts from engineering uh, and psychology and organizational s science to improve the way we work together. You know, that's, yes. that's my, my thing. But these three other guys, you know, they publish papers and books and create new concepts. They are like a Vicky. So I feel very, very fortunate that I'm working with them, even though it's going to be a year in May. And my, me, as a former engineer, I just want to have goals and milestones and, you know, what's happening. So I have to control myself not to push the group. But, you know, having uh, the Wisdom Project this past week, I started three new cohorts, three new groups. These are um, 
um, already um, 15, 14, 15, and 16 uh, in, um, regarding the number of cohorts that I have organized. Um, one person in the in those groups is a repeat offender, meaning that he's coming back. And I have people coming back even for four different sessions because it's like going to a meditation retreat center where you go every time you go, even though the practice is the same, you are new and you are different. It's like jumping in the river. The river is always different. So uh, the first time a person wanted to come for a second time, I said, no, Patricia, you know, it's the same. It's an oil. It's not the same. So now she has come four times. Wow. Yeah. So, and, and I see because I was telling my husband yesterday night, I am learning so much from the Wisdom Project. Every time I do it, I learn so much, so much. So even though the protocol is the same, the tools that people learn to use to solve their wicked problem are the same, uh, the experience is so new. Uh, there was a, a guy years ago, I don't remember the year, but it was like, I don't know, many, many years ago, he wrote a book called Dialogue. Uh, his name was David Bond, and he was a, a physicist, and he ran groups, groups where people practice dialogue. <clears throat> and he said that um, you have three levels of learning. And this is not uh, educational theory. The educators are going to go, what? And the psychologists are going to go, what? But he was a physicist, therefore he's allowed. And he talked about three levels of learning. Learning one is when you learn something new. Okay, I learned that you are tall. I learned that you are kind. I learned that you are smart. But then learning two is when you reframe. That, that's what I try to do with the Wisdom Project. How do you reframe the project of the, developing a positive relationship with your rebellious teenager? You have to switch the way you see the problem. So that's learning two. And then for David Bond, learning three is when in the process of going through learning one and learning two, you end up being you changed. Mm. The learning three is changing the way you are in the world, changing the way you relate to the problem. And that's what I'm trying to do with the Wisdom Project right now. That's my, that's my goal. So um, this week, oh, that's another risk for me. So to be so joyful is that I spoke with two people who finished the Wisdom Project more than a year ago. And I asked, are you using the tools? Because the Wisdom Project has 34 tools, some from meditation, some from cognitive science, some, some from <clears throat> organizational change management, how to change, how to manage change in organizations. And the idea is that they start using those tools to solve the problem, to address their project. But then the hope is that once they learn that these tools work in learning one, learning two, and learning three, or helping them frame, reframe, and then transject, um, they keep using them. You know, the whole goal is once one project at a time, we can change our world. We start with, okay, I want to improve the relationship with my sister. And then we say, oh, I can also improve the relationship with this group of colleagues. And then, oh, and I can use this also for, that's the idea of the Wisdom Project. So um, I spoke with these two people and, oh, it has been like a bath of well-being in, on, on my system because they both, in their own words, said, I am not using the tools because they are part of me right now. They are part of how I live my life. Um, well, if I can do that for a little group of people and, and leave something behind me when I die written on how to do that, it's a big, for me, it's a, it's a, it's a contribution to the well-being of my species, which I believe we need it um, a lot these days. So yeah. that's me. That's why I'm joyful. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So many things to be joyful about. And uh, while you're describing that, um, a few things came up for me. Like uh, I was reminded, you know, when I when I did the Wisdom Project myself, um, 
Yeah. And I was also a repeat offender, so <laughs> <laughs> one of those. Um, yeah, it, it seemed to me like one of the key fundamental things that happens while you're participating in the Wisdom Project, you it sort of brings that um it, it brings your attention to your wiser self. Um at least that's what I noticed with even some of the friends I introduced it to. They found that they knew these things. Like they had been problem solving or learning to transject themselves, but they were doing it without intention. And so it would happen sometimes by accident, uh, but they wouldn't know how to reproduce that effect. You know, if, if, it ha- if they happen to be challenged in a situation and, you know, they, they were full of joy and uh, the stars aligned and so many things worked together, they would manage to transject themselves into, you know, learning all the, you know, all the, in, the, in all those three ways. But it wouldn't happen repetitively and they wouldn't do it with intention, like on command, like knowing that I have this problem, I need uh, to develop a strategy to manage it and I can actually work at it and get the result. And so going through uh, the Wisdom Project, sort of, I think, one of the things you're gifting there is very similar to what you know you managed to get from Seva Veki and all the other publications that you expose. You you, you manage to cultivate a a new language uh, that that is much you know palatable for someone who has not had that that knowledge or has not done that kind of exploration on their own, and so they can just take this and just you know, use it instantly. At least that's what I found. And and you find that in most cases, when we're confronted with these wicked problems, one important thing we need is like, we just need company. We need, because it's it can be overwhelming. And we need um, for us to, to be able to deal with it optimally, we need to slow down. But our... You know, when we're in those situations, naturally the anxiety spikes up. And so it's very difficult to slow down and sort of like build a space uh, between yourself and what you're dealing with so that you can, you know, have a perspective that you can use to, you know, assess and and sort of like start to do the, the, the problem breakdown that will allow you uh to see where you can start from like to to make it small enough for you to get close and contend with it so you can easily become overwhelmed and you know get frightened because of how you're looking at it you're, you're standing too close to it uh and you're struck by this because you're too close it's too big it's frightening so you freeze um but if you have a friend with you, they can just whisper in your ear and say, hey, you know, take a step back. A couple more steps, maybe. It's not going to, you're, you're going to be fine. And if you do that, then you can actually see better. And if you can see better, then you can break it down. And I think once you've had the experience of doing that with one of these wicked problems, then you can reapply that because now you know how to you know how to take a step back and to break things down and then now allow for your experience that you've sort of like cultivated over, you know, through life to start generating some of these insights that are going to help you deal with it. And, and I've, I believe like the main difference is that doing it by accident, <laughs> it feels like you're not doing it. And so learning a skill of how to deal with it, I think has is very is very vital. Like personally for me, it's changed my my whole approach to life. Like even being able to do this, like a, a project like this one that we're doing right now, was way far off. Uh, let's say two three years. It's something that I would you know talk about wishing to do, but 
coming down and breaking down a strategy and and you know sort of like orienting myself towards achieving that objective it was a bit daunting like even if you can even cognitively work it out like actually taking the step and actually starting is so it's such a huge challenge um but i think when you've practiced in many small ways right like overcoming you know challenges in different aspects you then build the confidence of uh of doing this like you 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 cultivate the strength of that muscle and now you can now start using it to try and tackle things that seem to be bigger and <laughs> to uh, out of reach for you and now you can even get closer to them because you know you, you have some confidence now you you have some experience and uh it it can go a long way and so i think the work you're doing with the wisdom project is really really wonderful and it's it's a great contribution uh and i would say i encourage you to continue doing it because it's uh personally i've gained so much from it and i think like you might have seen that thread uh, you sent to our cohort you, you hear the things that people are doing it's like so much progress and and the strange thing is like when this happens when we transject ourselves to use that term uh all of a sudden we have all this new found capability and new found capacity that now there's just too much to do <laughs> and it's not it's not that the situation is challenging you or overwhelming you but now you have more courage to take on more things and and in that process you're finding yourself like your time is really precious because you you know some of those things that you really want to be attributing it to like how you described the wisdom project is it's sort of always renewing it's almost I was, I, like I, the, the thing that came up was like oh maybe we should call it the sacred project because if it's always changing then maybe it's it's more than just being wise um uh but yeah so oh, okay oh, that's, that's 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 wisdom. That came up. yeah <laughs> oh okay wow that's very very nice yeah because that's I am another thing I don't understand yet about the wisdom project is why it generates so much well-being. It's like we do the wisdom project and we start experiencing some contentment and joy of being alive. Yeah. And I don't you know I I I know I taste it, I experience it. But you know, I want to have uh, an explanation, a scientific explanation, and I still don't grasp it. Uh, <clears throat> but perhaps um, one day I'll have it, but hope I have it. I hope I will have it. But it's this sense that being renewed, because every time you frame something and then learning one, oh, I got this. Learning to, no, I didn't get it right. I have to redo it. Learning to, and then learning three in the process of doing this, wow, I am transformed. So it's this sense of being renewed, of being changed, of being in wonder and enchantment of the opportunity, of the miracle of being alive. And that's why I understand when you use the word sacred more than wisdom. It's just like, wow. And that's why I have these four uh, ground rules when we start the journey of the Wisdom Project. The first one is presence, because we are going to notice, as you said, that we are wiser than we thought. And that's why I start the sessions with King Solomon, the very famous uh, king of the Bible who wrote proverbs and books and, and people traveled to see him. But he was very, very foolish, too. He had too many women in his life. He went bankrupt a few times. He like loved gambling and drinking. So he was a, not a perfect uh, wise person. So I like to start the journey of the Wisdom Project with him as a role model that we, imperfect as we are, we can also have wisdom. And as you said, there is a repository of uh, wisdom in all of us. 
but that's being present with that wisdom and imperfection that is in ourselves, like it was in King Solomon. But then the other one, as you mentioned, is the courage to keep going. And when we don't have the courage because we get frustrated, because we get anxious, because we tried to do it and we didn't succeed, then the other two ground rules is please be kind to yourself. Because you are doing it, you are trying to transform your life, yourself, your community, your workplace, your family. So please be kind. Treat yourself well. And if it just so happens that you cannot be kind or you cannot be courage, co courageous or you cannot be present, at least be compassionate. Be, have compassion for your human condition. So I keep repeating these are the ground rules of the journey towards wisdom. Be present, be courageous, be kind, and be compassionate. In the pro, <clears throat> as you said, the process has, as people don't like when we use this word, some people, but there is this sense of sacredness, of the sacredness of being alive and being in community. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I find that, you know, it's also, and I was writing about this earlier actually today, it sort of introduces you to the community of yourself. Uh, I'm curious what you think about that because it seems to me like the wiser selves, right? Like within us, they 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 are always there and they're they're doing their part. It's just that they are overshadowed by all these other selves that you know arise in us, and you know we have to deal with uh, different situations. Um, however, it seems like it's like a whole community of ourselves working together, right? <laughs> Trying to put us in the most optimal place that we can be and so we can do the best that we can. And I feel like when, at least from my experience, you know, with, you know, some of my friends, like, you know, like Paula uh, was sharing, you know, like Alexandra, it's like you, 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 you get to this optimal realignment kind of like that transjection like you get this optimal realignment whereby it's like now you've found the the spot where you should actually stand in in this drama called your life and all of a sudden you you're too strong for the things that have been you know wiping you out every time and now they're not they're a little bit of an annoyance when it happens, but it's not like a threat, like an overwhelming frustration of like, oh my God, I feel like my life is ending now. It's like, no, it's a, uh, that thing happens. It's a little bit of an annoyance. I, I know how to deal with it. I, I It's going to happen only for like maybe the next hour or so. And then my life is going to get back on track. So it gives you that flexibility whereby you're very brave to take on some of these things. And and now through that, it, it's like you, you, you have that foresight. You have the foresight of this is going to, you know, subside in about this long and life still has to continue. So as much as it is distracting me from this other thing that I really would want to be focusing on, uh, I have to honor it so that it can go away and I get back to what I want to do. And then, you know, and, and also in the process, you've developed the taste for what you really want to do. Uh, yeah, I, was, I was having a chat with a guy called Daniel. Uh, I don't know if you've managed to watch it, but but we were talking about what he called the apophatic walking stick. And it's sort the of what? like the apophatic walking stick. Uh, and we're, we're saying it's... Uh, it's this sense for for the mystery that you need to follow, right? And you can only know it by knowing what it's not. <laughs> so, you, so you can't really articulate what it is, but you, you know exactly what it isn't. And so you, you're drawn to it, and the only way you're following it is kind of like uh, how... 
uh, the white cane that a blind person uses works. Uh, they tap it uh, to find the edges of the path so that they can know where the path is. So <laughs> they are not, it's not telling them that this is the path, it's telling them where the path is not. It's like, oh, there's no path this way, there's no path that way. So just walk between those two spaces <laughs> and just keep going. And the moment you find that there's a thing in front of you, then there's definitely no path there. So <laughs> find a way out. And it's just, it's sending a negative data stream of data of what things you should ignore. <laughs> and I remember like in one of the classes, we, we, we covered that one, one interesting um, property of uh, being wise is knowing what you should not do. It's like, you may not know what to do, right? But, but you suddenly know what you shouldn't do. And I think that becomes much more clear uh, in terms of like what you should ignore, where you shouldn't be spending your time, uh, where you're going to waste your effort. And in the process, the things that are left, like once all those things are cleared away, they may not be the, the things you thought were going to be there, and they may not be the things you're best equipped to do, but suddenly you know these have much more potential and uh, they, they have a higher chance of probability <laughs> of success compared to all the other things that you removed. Uh, yeah, so I don't know, like, what what do you make of those? <laughs> um, well, so many things to say. Um, uh, being wise is perhaps also a wicked project because you were talking about the things that show that you are not in the path or when you get thrown out of the path and in my meditation practice um, called my initial meditation practice called Vipassana taught by Goinka Ji in his, in his um, numerous uh, retreat centers across the world. We have one here in Western Massachusetts, like two hours of, of west of Boston. And that's the meditation center that I really like. Um, <clears throat> they call it impurities that you live your life in this state of contentment and joy and making the right decisions and tackling the right problems and being active in the world in a positive way guided by by the virtues that you want to cultivate uh, compassion, empathy generosity etc. And then you get disturbed, and they call it impurities. So um, part of the four things that you have to cultivate presence is to acknowledge the impurities and have the courage to see what to do with them. So you can come back to the well-being state that you have um, cultivated. And the tools that are presented in the Wisdom Project are for that. I just want to, I don't know if it's too related or perhaps it is intuitively, I just want to say that um, living life in harmony is a wicked problem because we can say, okay, I'm going to get married, I'm going to have two kids, I'm going to buy a house, I'm going to find a good career, and then you start doing those, and then you feel frustrated, tired. So you have to stop and rethink what it is that you really want, as you said. If you want to build a house, it's not, it's complicated. It's a humongous project, but it's not complex. It's, you know, you know, the house has to have two bathrooms, hopefully a kitchen, a living room, the bedrooms, you know, a little porch, a garage, hopefully, you know, you know how to do it. And then the person that you're going to hire, if you're not going to do it yourself, is a good carpenter, carpenter or brick master that are going to be putting things together so it's complicated mm -hmm. you know it's not as complicated as landing um, a robot on, on the moon as it happened recently it's complicated 
But in both cases, you can do a task, a breakdown of all the tasks that are involved in putting the, the robot on the moon or building yourself a new house. Instead, a wicked problem is complex because when, once you start doing it, like planning a life, you don't know where you're going to be in two, three years. And perhaps you have to stop and reevaluate everything. That's a wicked, you know, problem. And, and the concept of wicked is not um, from me, you know, like many years ago, two uh, scientists who wrote about how to make policy, they said, you know, making policy for climate change is a wicked problem because you start doing things and then suddenly something new happens. Um, making a policy for education is another wicked problem. Because you start doing it and suddenly you have too many grads from, from, from college that cannot find jobs. So those problems are very complex, not only complicated. And life per se is a complex problem. Therefore, we have to be equipped with all the tools to stop at a particular moment and evaluate where, where to go next. And that's what I'm trying to do with the Wisdom Project to share with people insights from the sages of the past, like King Solomon or Socratic dialogues or contemporary so uh, dialogue like the physicist David Bond and his learning one, learning two, and learning three model of what dialogues does for you. Um, <clears throat> and... Um, and see how people can incorporate that into their lives to tackle, as I said, and you, and you said to this project, but then another project and another project and another project. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I think it's, you know, it reminds me of um, uh, the, the challenge that my son once presented to me <laughs> about he likes asking these why questions, right? And uh, he he's always asking for the one answer. Like, you know, I want, tell me the one thing that, it's as if that's what he's asking, right? Like when he asks you, why must I do this? It's The assumption is there's just one thing uh, you must do, right? Uh, which also reminded me of another problem that my, my good friend was asking me. like, what is the, what is the one thing you must do for a successful uh, romantic relationship? <laughs> and you're going like, what makes you think it's just one thing? Like, wh where do you get this idea that there's just one thing? Uh, you know, like, I, I, I was telling, I, I asked my friend when they asked me that, I was like, so do you drive like a car? And they said, yes, I drive a car. So I asked them, if I were to ask you what is the one thing I need to do to be a good driver, what 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 would you say? And it's it it, it sort of like brings it home because driving a car is a, a wicked problem, right? It's like you have to keep your eyes on the road, you have to know where the steering wheel is, you have to be able to shift the gear, you have to step on the pedals, there's like you know which pedals you have to watch the side mirrors. But you have to do all these, I don't know, like 17 different things all at once. And the moment one of them goes wrong, <laughs> the whole thing fails, which is similar to what I was saying my son, like, you know, riding a bike. It's a bucket of things you have to do all at once. And if one of them fails, the, the riding of the bike fails. <laughs> and so you. It's a dynamic, complex thing. Yeah. <laughs> It's doing many things, but doing them in synchronicity as if it's one thing, such that it just looks like it's, it's that one activity. And I think uh, go, learning that this is also the same theme with uh, life, like you have to do a whole symphony of things all at once just to make, you know, life just work. Right, like, <laughs> well, well, they'll tell you. People will say, you know, I think this is very common in Christianity. It's like just live one day at a time. I think it's very, it's very wise advice because, you know, there's a lot to do in a day. 
There's a lot you need to navigate. And if you're trying you to... Gave me, <laughs> a, a year ago or so, you gave me, or more, you gave me this beautiful sentence that I have repeated a lot. It's... Um, I just try to live every day as closer as the light as I can. Yes. We were, I, you know, we were discussing enlightenment and I yeah. asked you, uh, because I really don't care about enlightenment <laughs> or I don't believe in it. I don't know exactly what it is. Um, and then you said, I don't know, Iris, but I just try to live every day as closer as the light as I can. And then at the end of the day, I look back and I say, evaluate if I did what I had, had the purpose of doing during the day. And that was yeah. beautiful and very, very powerful. And I use it because sometimes I get into contact with people that are so enamored of, oh, if I do enough practice, I'll get enlightened. And I say, okay, just do it. And then when you get enlightened, come and touch me and enlighten me. Because apparently that's what you can do once you are enlightened. But I have met many people who have done the the work and then claim they're enlightened and I am not so sure that they have enough kindness and compassion in them um, as to be really an inspiration for others so yeah I resonate with what you just said yeah, it, 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 it's, it's uh, you know, speaking of enlightenment, what, what they say about it is like it's still uh, collecting water and chopping wood <laughs> before mm-hmm. enlightenment. I think it was Rick, Rick Repetti who was saying this, like, you know, before enlightenment, uh, you're still fetching water and chopping wood. After enlightenment, you're still fetching water and chopping wood. Like, yes, the, yes, the yes. Yes, yes, yes. The basics of life must continue. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And also, um, the way that is um, promoted or presented is that you have to live a monastic life and basically spend your life disengaged. Not as a f- Even the Buddha left his child and wife, and he left everything to pursue enlightenment as much as I honor and respect, and I'm really appreci- appreciative for <clears throat> the techniques that I have learned that he developed, um, you know, uh, for 2,500 years, the idea is that you will become a monk. You have to deprive yourself and life of your being in the world. So I always think, okay, so this wonderful wisdom that has benefited me, as I said, I not only teach meditation, but I have been a dedicated meditator meditator for years um, how that impacts my world or it's only a masturbatory pleasure for me oh I am in line oh I you know if it doesn't impact my the way I relate to my sisters to my mom to my colleagues to my partners at work you know so how can this wonderful uh, wisdom of mindfulness, for instance, impact society. Mm. And that's why my okay, my motto is one project at a time. We can change our world with the wisdom project. But my overall goal is to democratize wisdom, to bring mm. all these um, techniques and practices of the past to be shared by the community at large, the same way that we all right now can read and write, that not being able to read and write is a big um, challenge to function in a productive society. And it's the responsibility of our governments to educate everybody so people have access to this technology, the technology of writing and the technology of reading. I believe that the technology of wisdom is also something that has to be shared. That has to be democratized. Uh, Jesus, <clears throat> um, uh, we don't know exactly what happened between his 12th and 30th birthday, but apparently he went someplace to be trained. And then already when he was preaching, there was a time when he went to the desert. I think it was for 40 days. Uh, and he was tempted by the devil. You know, he was tempted. 
So he had to practice certain discipline. And the Buddha also, after three years of practicing all types of meditations of his time, one day he said, okay, I'm just going to sit below this fig tree and I'm not going to stand until I get enlightened. And he spent 39 days sitting there without moving. So there is practice. There is this discipline. And Socrates, the legend goes that he was able to stand, um, you know, supported by a column, you know, with his back on the column. And he didn't move for like, I don't know, three hours or three days or whatever. So um, there is this discipline that people cultivate in them. So mm -hmm. what are the disciplines? What are the practices where we can be fathers and mothers and uncles and, and, and daughters? and productive members of our work community and our community at large, and at the same time cultivate these practices in a way that is not monastic. And so that's what I am uh, trying to do, and, and also many other people, not only me, um, because um, society has become so complex. The problems now are wicked. And we cannot expect that because we went to school and perhaps we got a college degree and we are successful at work, we have the capacity to understand all the things that are happening around us because the society has become very, very, very complex. So it's very easy to get manipulated. Um, there is a new branch of psychology, well, not so new, but it's a new branch of psychology called liminal psychology or no, imaginal psychology. Mm. Imaginal means uh, that you can cultivate something that is bigger than your imagination because it's felt. It's when, like when you are in the presence of a religious experience, when you go to church. When you are at the presence of um, a beautiful child that is learning to walk, there is this feeling that you, you said it at the beginning. It's almost like sacred. OK, so imaginal psychology has built a whole set of tools to help people using their imagination in a very felt sense to take care of different psychopathologies. For instance, there is a something called exposure therapy, where mm. people who have, let's say, fear of spiders, they let to imagine, but feeling not only in, oh, I'm imagining that I am watching a spider. No, no, no. I am imagining that I am really in front of the spider. The spider is going to bite me, da, da, da. And then people get healed by practicing imaginal psychology. So, um, I don't know where I'm going with this. I just got, was going to, I was talking about the need to make these things popular. Then yes. they need to make them accessible to people. So when you, the, the, let's say you, like you are an engineer and you're confronted with a big, big challenge at work, you can use some of these tools, knowing that seriously, seriously, by doing imaginal work, imagining that you have solved the problem, whatever problem you have at work, you will develop new ideas on how to do it and you will be able to do it. So in my work as an organizational consultant, um, you know, you go to an organization, everybody has a degree, everybody is kind of even, you know, if they complain, they, they have a middle class job, they have a career, so things are not bad. And then, so therefore they knew, they know certain psychological concepts because they read the newspapers, because whatever. Um, but they don't have that integrated in a way that allows them to pierce through, through the problems. And as you were saying a while ago, they do it by accident. Yeah. Oh, it happened, but how do I repeat it? And so that's what I'm trying to do. There are tools that can be organized in a certain way so you can repeat that, so you can make it intentional. As I was saying a few minutes ago, I spoke with two people who finished the Wisdom Project more than two years ago, and they say, I have, in I have integrated what I learned in my life, so I'm using it all the time. So that's what I mean by democratizing wisdom. 
And wow. yes, sometimes it feels sacred. Um, I'm always careful to say that because I don't want to sound religious or something. But when you are committed to life and you are benefiting the, yourself and the people around you, being respectful and respecting, you know, kindness and compassion, it just feels like you're serving, you know, your your community. Which is great. And I think uh, you're doing a great uh, job there, at, you know, unlocking people's potential and uh, enabling people more. And I think you're, you're very spot on with it being a technology that we have to uh, adapt and learn to work with, uh, especially with the rise of the advancement of technology, you know, with things like AI. Uh, I, I was talking to a friend the other day and, and it seems like we have to, you know, for, for thousands of years, like millions of years, right? Like we were just the only ones who can do this human thing, like behave in a human way. And now we've trained these machines and now they can also uh, present themselves in a human way. And now we have to work harder to to sort of like do the the human thing better than, <laughs> than them. It's like we have to be more human. And so we're being challenged in, in all aspects. Uh, you know, you you will sit down and write something and then some people are reading it and go like, oh, wait, did you actually write it? Or did you, did the machine write it, right? It's like, it, what, I can't tell them apart. Like, you know, now they can make videos. It's like, oh, did did you actually create it or was it generated by an AI? And so there's there's that uh, suspicion of the what the capability of the technology is. However, like you know, we're speaking before we started recording. It's like there's the the resonance, right? Like <laughs> with with the machine generated uh, content so far, like it still lacks the quality that brings about that resonance, uh, at least not to the degree that the human generated content, uh, you know, can evoke. And so uh, we may still have a bit of an edge, but we don't know. They, they learn really quickly. <laughs> so we don't know what will happen. You know, on, in my, on my laptop, I have a folder on the desktop with something that Plato said 2,000 plus years ago, 2,300 years ago, I think, that he was opposed to, to writing. You know that Socrates didn't write anything. He just spoke on dialogues. And this, the legend says that Plato was his a student and he was able to write about the dialogues because people cultivated these uh, very, very deep memorization skills with a lot of memorization techniques. And before <clears throat> paper was av available, you know, they use uh, papyr made from, from, I don't know the name in English of the, of the plant. Papyrus? That, papyrus, okay. So that grows, in, you know, on the rivers of the Nile, on the on the sides of the river of the Nile River, um, there was, you know, diff there was difficulty in, in finding materials to write. So people just had to memorize, and there were uh, travelers that went from town to town and they repeated stories. That's how people got to know what was happening in the village. Uh, two hours down the road, and what happened in the capital six hours, you know, far away because these people had great memorization skills. So I like that writing of Plato, Plato so much because basically he's saying that, oh, I don't like writing. I don't like this technology because we are going to lose the capacity of memorize as we did in the past. And I, I love it because he was right. He was right. We cannot memorize anything. We just forget what we wrote, read in our phone 10 minutes ago. But we created many other ways of replacing that wonderful memory that those travelers had. Mm -hmm. It took years, you know, um, 
well, not two years. You know, the the libraries were invented. Um, Alexander the Great went to Egypt and invented, created the first library of the world, where people had these rolls of papyrus, you know, with the information, and it became a way of controlling a. a a community to burn the books. Let's burn the books because we are burning their history, their knowledge. And then, um, I don't know how many years, but in 1500s in, in Europe, Gothenburg invented the printing press. And it was possible then to copy the Bible, which until then was copied only in monasteries with a lot of care. And as soon as the printing press was invented. Uh, the Bible, you know, is the, the book that has been printed the most throughout history, was accessible to everybody. And then a few years later, a few years, like 100 years later, Martin Luther came and said that salvation was personal and therefore everybody has to learn to read the Bible. And so people have to have Bibles and people have to read. So it's like one advance, one technological advance brings the other one and the other one and the other one. And that's how I feel about AI. We are going to, we are going to invent something. We are going to invent something where our society will be richer technologically because we have incorporated AI. And for that, we need this technology of wisdom cultivation. I call it the technology of wisening, to be wiser. If I'm here, I want to be here in terms of wisdom. I want to be able to understand my mind. So they in, in marketing, and that's where I was going to go with imaginal psychology. Imaginal psychology is used all the time in marketing. The way every time we see a commercial, every time a politician talks to us, everything has been designed to seduce us, to seduce the mind. So we have to learn to incorporate those tools in our day-to-day -day lives so we can educate our kids, protect our families, etc. So democratizing wisdom is not a... I think it's a, it's a mandatory thing to do, like we do with writing and reading, uh, despite Plato, um, we have managed to do wonderful things, teaching everybody to write and read, so I think everybody should learn to wise it themselves. Because all of us, as you said, have this little piece of Solomon, King Solomon on, the, on them. Yes, and, and in agreement and, um, you know, given the time, um, I, I would like to invite you to uh, maybe talk more about uh, where people can find uh, the, the Wisdom Project, the training program. And of course, we'll add all the links in the show notes. And uh, it's been really wonderful speaking to you, Iris. Uh, would you mind sharing a few closing remarks? Excuse me? My closing... Uh... Okay, uh, people can find me on my website, irisstamberger.com, I-R-I-S-S-T-A-M-M-B-E-R-G-E-R. They can find me also on Twitter at Iris Stamberger. Or, um, yeah, that does too. On my website, there is an email there. There is also a phone. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, on Twitter. And YouTube. So you, you can also go to YouTube and there is a channel there called Iris Stamberger. And I'm continuously running uh, workshops, the next group of workshops will start um, in the middle of April, I think April 19. And I have workshops for all hours for Australia. Right now I have somebody from Denmark, people from the States, people from Argentina. So I run them so people from different areas of the globe can join us on an online platform. And the workshop shop right now is seven weeks, two hours uh, each week. Well, it's always a pleasure talking to you, Irish, and I hope we can do this one more time. Uh, yes. I'll stop this one for now. <laughs> Thank you very much.